Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Robert Self, and I'm the chair of the history department. And it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to welcome you to this book launch and celebration for Jim Green's Exile Within Exiles, um, which is also for sale, as you saw out, uh, out front. Let's see if I can get the stand. That'll be, maybe, it may not do that. OK. Uh, these kinds of uh, book launch celebrations are, uh, are ones that uh, history has participated in in the last couple of years. And it's a real treat to be able to celebrate a book that is so long. And I, I don't mean this particular book, but books that are so long in the making and are such a part of the scholar's life for so long. Uh, and then they go out into the world uh, and like little children, and they do their own thing. And right, they, go, they go away. They leave home. Um, so it's nice to kind of mark that special occasion with, uh, with the celebration, with, with uh, a scholarly uh, conversation, as we'll have uh, this afternoon. I want to say a li just a little bit about the book, um, in case you haven't read it, uh, so that it'll f help frame the conversation. What will happen in the event this afternoon is that uh, two uh, uh, guests, two scholars, one from outside Brown and one from here at Brown, um, will talk for 15 minutes, talk a little bit about the book, their impressions, uh, uh, some aspects of the book they like to highlight. And then the author, Jim, uh, will, uh, will speak also for 15 minutes or so, respond, discuss the book, some other aspects of it. And then we'll open it up for a Q&A for uh, question and answers afterward. Let me tell you just a little bit about, uh, about the book. So the book is called Exiled Within Exiles, Herbert Daniel, Gay Brazilian Revolutionary. Um, Daniel was a significant figure in the Brazilian uh, left, in the Brazilian leftist revolutionary politics uh, from about the mid-1960s until his death in 1992. He was a medical student when he first joined a uh, revolutionary guerrilla organization, where he was, um, not, uh, not surprisingly, uh, forced into the closet, forced to conceal his sexual identity, which he uh, considered and thought of as an internal exile. Um, he then, because of government repression, spent uh, the good part of the, a good part of the 1970s in external or physical exile in, uh, in Europe. He returned to Brazil in 1981, where he became engaged in electoral politics and social activism uh, to champion gay rights, feminism, and environmental justice. And he achieved global recognition as an activist uh, uh, fighting discrimination against those who have HIV AIDS, uh, a disease from which he himself died in 1992. So Jim's book explores Daniel's deep commitment to leftist politics beginning in the 1960s, using his personal and political experiences, the personal and the political, to investigate opposition to Brazil's military dictatorship, the left's construction of revolutionary masculinity and sexuality, um, and the challenge that the transition to democracy after the military dictatorship posed to radical movements. So it's, an, it's a really wonderful arc using the life of Herbert Daniel. That's just a little bit about the book. You'll learn more about the book as the evening progresses. Let me introduce the panelists, and then I will uh, step aside um, and only return uh, just to sort of field questions in the Q&A period. Let me start with James Jim Green, the Carlos Manuel uh, de Cespedes Professor of Latin American History and one of the leading scholars of the history of modern Brazil in the United States, alongside one of our guests, Barbara Weinstein. I'll come to her in a second. He is the former director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown and a past president of the Brazilian Studies Association. At present, he is director of Brown's Brazil Initiative, the executive director of the Brazilian Studies Association, which now finds its home at Brown, and the director of the Opening the Archives Project. This is a very interesting project to digitize over 100,000 State Department documents related to US-Brazil relations, particularly during the period of the military dictatorship in Brazil. The list of Jim's national and international activities is far too lengthy uh, to recount here, uh, including his more than half a dozen edited and co-authored books, and as I say, a number of activities too lengthy uh, to mention here. If you're interested, go to our website in the history department, and you can find them there. So I'll just close this brief introduction with his single-authored uh, single books. His first was the prize-winning Beyond Carnival, Male Homosexuality in 20th Century Brazil, which was published in both English and Portuguese. 
He followed that with, we cannot remain silent, opposition to the Brazilian military dictatorship in the United States, 1964 to 1985. This brings us to the book we're celebrating this afternoon, Exile Within Exiles, Herbert Daniel, Gay Brazilian Revolutionary, published by Duke this past fall. To help us inaugurate, uh, launch, uh, celebrate the book, we have uh, two uh, scholars uh, of enormous achievement in their own right. Uh, first, on my immediate left, Barbara Weinstein. She is Silver Professor of History at New York University and past president of the American Historical Association. This is, by the way, about the highest honor you can achieve in the profession of history. She's also a former department chair, which warms my heart at the moment. <laughs> Her publications include The Amazon Rubber Boom, 1850 to 1920, For Social Peace in Brazil, Industrialist and the Remaking of the Working Class in Sao Paulo, and The Color of Modernity, Sao Paulo and the Making of Race and Nation in Brazil. She has written widely and extensively, two words I stress, in the Academy and boasts a list of articles and book chapters several pages long. Her research has received support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. And just recently in 2017-18, she was a fellow at the Coleman Center uh, for Scholars and Writers, that's at the uh, New York Public Library, where she worked on an intellectual biography of the pioneering Latin Americanist Frank Tannenbaum. And that's the current book that you're finishing now? Great. So, well, not um, finishing up exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's working Continuing to work on. Yeah. Great. It's really a, a treasure and delight to have um, uh, the esteemed Barbara Weinstein with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, on the far left is Leila Lennon. Associate Professor of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies and the chair of that department, having joined Brown from the University of New Mexico this past fall. She is also currently president of the American Portuguese Studies no Association. Longer. No, no longer. longer. She is no longer. She is no longer. She is the past president <laughs> of the Portuguese <laughs> Studies Association. Um, I, th I think what I'm trying to do is, is emphasize the amount of uh, the, the, the sheer scale of knowledge and expertise we have uh, present on the panel this evening. Uh, Lenin has lived and studied in France, Brazil, Germany, India, and the United States. She studied German literature at the Eberhard Karls Universität in Germany, and then completed a master's in comparative literature at the University of Washington in Seattle and a PhD at Vanderbilt. Her research and teaching lie primarily in contemporary Brazilian and Latin American uh, literature, particularly the intersection between social justice and cultural production, something that Jim also works on. Uh, she's published on topics such as the representation of human rights in contemporary Afro-Brazilian literature, memory, literature in Brazil's military dictatorship, and the interface between citizenship and literature, among other themes. In addition to many articles, she is the author of the 2013 book, Citizenship and Crises in Contemporary Brazilian Literature. I'm really looking forward to hearing the panel, to hearing uh, both our, our, our commentators and, uh, and Jim. So thank you for coming, and I will, uh, without ado, uh, turn it over to them. Either way. I, please. OK, I'll go first then. OK, thank you. Um, so first, I want to uh, thank um, Robert Self and, um, and particularly Jim Green for uh, including me in this. And uh, it's wonderful to be here for this event. And I only wish I didn't have to teach at 11 a.m. tomorrow in New York, so I have to take a 6 a.m. Amtrak back to, never mind. <laughs> so, but, um, I have been thinking a great deal about James Green's new book, and about the short, remarkable life of Herbert Daniel for nearly three years now, partly because I had the privilege of being a reader of the manuscript for Duke University Press, and partly because around that time I was trying to decide whether my next book should be a biography. And I was looking around for biographical studies written, written by historians as opposed to journalists or biographers. And I just realized I'm reading the wrong version of this talk. So I'm actually going to close this, and I'm going to reopen it, and I'm going to read the right version. That would give me an opportunity to say, so the first 
true rule of being chair of a department and being host of an event is to thank the people who actually put the event on. <laughs> Just a line of me from the Central Latin American Studies and Period Studies. I'm very sorry. And I think Kate Goldman, Robert, and Kate Goldman also, who is the key organizer, is in the booth back there. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for allowing me. Uh, may I call well, well, that was just great because I did like one of like the most boneheaded things you can do in a talk, and it worked out well for both of us. Okay, um, so I was casting about for biographical works written by historians that could provide a model for my own study. Reading the manuscript of Exile Within Exiles was one of the things that made me decide to do the biography. And it almost moved me, and it also moved me to think about what it means to write a biography, rather than the standard scholarly historical monograph. Most historians, myself included, most historians, myself included, and Jim to some extent, though I'm gonna um, kind of modify that slightly, organize their book projects around a historical problem or question. And even though our research may take us in some unexpected directions, and we may be able to enliven our arguments with intriguing anecdotes, we still labor within the confines of our analytical framework. And while I always try to write in a clear and lively manner, I generally regard that as an optional feature. <laughs> Reading a serious work of history is a little bit like eating your vegetables. It's good for you even when it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> I should say that Jim Green's scholarship from the outset tended to defy those academic conventions. Both of his first two monographs, Beyond Carnival and We Cannot Remain Silent, which Robert has already talked about, um, have the earmarks of serious, innovative, source-based historical studies. But both are more engaging and creative than the usual historical monograph. In other words, Jim was never interested in writing the standard eat your vegetables <laughs> monograph. <laughs> I don't like me, so. <laughs> okay, so. Um, but the biographical form strikes me as exceptionally suited to what I perceive as Jim's mission in life, at least his academic life, though I think Jim is the rare academic who seamlessly connects his scholarship and his life as a public intellectual and as, well, a, a human being. The biographical form resists the problem-driven interpretive narrative that is the backbone of most historical monographs. The lived experience of the subject in question, especially if one chooses well, makes it impossible to avoid tangents and detours and unexpected developments. The biographer certainly shapes the story, deciding what to put in and what to leave out, who to interview, what sources to consult, what acts and episodes to foreground, but there is a limit to how much shaping one can manage without doing violence to the life one is portraying. And if lively, enjoyable writing is optional in most history books, it's absolutely essential for a biography, since in the first instance, it's the story um, that will engage the reader's attention. Even a biography of a high-profile historical figure, for example, David Blight's new book on Frederick Douglass, attracts readers in the first place not because we think that we will learn something novel about historical process. For that, we should read Blight's first book, Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory. It's not that we won't learn a great deal of history from reading Blight's biography of Douglas or Jim's biography of Herbert Zaniel, but there won't be the kind of obvious analytical takeaway that we get with the historical monograph. So the successful biographer has to write well and has to constantly, if implicitly, make an argument for why we should be paying attention to the life of this particular individual. Of course, some biographical sub subjects are self-explanatory. Think Lincoln, Hitler, um, because the subject is a priori interesting to many readers. Others are more of a life history and focus on someone who is being studied as emblematic of a certain category, a peasant, a labor leader, an indigenous activist. Sidney Mintz's Worker in the Cane um, was, is a sort of an, uh, uh, the sort of early example of this, and he doesn't even use his subject's real name. So you can count 
on those interested in those struggles of the particular group to be drawn to that life history. But Jim's choice, Herberto Daniel, strikes me as especially challenging. In part, this book, this book <laughs> is a recuperative project to save Daniel from, if not total, maybe semi-oblivion. But the act of recuperation has to be paired with an implicit argument about the worth worthiness of his subject. For Herbert Daniel does not, or at least did not, have the kind of name recognition that would make him immediately interesting to a wider public, whether in the US or Brazil. I think Jim's book is rapidly changing that, mm -hmm. certainly, in Brazil. And though there are moments when he might seem emblematic of a particular, Daniel may seem emblematic of a cer certain set of historical actors, as Exile Within Exiles makes amply clear, he was too idiosyncratic, too quirky, and his trajectory too exceptional for him to stand in for a particular historical type. So why should a reader buy Exile Within Exiles? Why should an instructor assign this book? The answer is pretty obvious, I think, for the Brazilian edition, which appeared almost simultaneously with the English language edition, something which, let me say, is highly unusual. Given the efforts of the new ruling regime, regime in Brazil to rehabilitate the military dictatorship and to stigmatize and denigrate the LGBT plus population, a book about someone who fought against the dictatorship and agitated for gay rights has considerable appeal to the substantial segment of the Brazilian population that regards Bolsonaro's election as a national and maybe even transnational tragedy. It also helps that Herbert Daniel was in the vanguarda revolucionaria popular with the young Gilma Josef, whose impeachment on spurious charges set in motion the political events that led to the current predicament. The answer to why read this book is a little less evident for the English language version. My first would, response would be, it's a pleasure to read. My second response is that you get a sense of the texture of everyday life in Brazil during the 1960s that is not easily attainable in more mainstream historical studies. We can see so vividly the contradictions of Brazilian life in that decade, with universities becoming more open to people like Daniel, who Daniel was his given first name, so Herbert Her Daniel Her Her was, was his given first name. What? Herbert is his given first name. Oh, is it? I thought it was Daniel Eustachio was his. No, it's Herbert. 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 Oh, that's Herbert. right. They all have H's. I'm with an Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, right. You're right. So, yeah, no, no wonder he <laughs> didn't like it. But, um, uh, so with universities becoming more open to people like Daniel from a modest lower middle class family, even as the political arena was becoming ever, ever more constricted. It also provides a fully re rendered portrait of an incipient guerrilla group preparing for armed struggle that neither heroicizes nor sentimentalizes the endeavor. And the accounts of Herbert Daniel's physical inadequacies and his determination to overcome them remind me of the best passages in Che Guevara's episodes of the Revolutionary War, when he talks about his own incompetence and the debilitating effects of his asthmatic condition. Furthermore, I can't think of another book on this era in Latin America that so thoroughly illuminates the material and psychological hardships first of clandestinity and then of exile. And I should mention that all of this is available to us because of the incredible amount of research, including by my count 87 interviews with various academics, act activists, et cetera, uh, by Jim, who knew Herbert Daniel and participated in some of the same clandestine movements. And then, we get to witness the initial struggles of men and women who self-identified as gay and lesbian to form a movement and to claim rights, and to do so amidst the staggering impact of the AIDS epidemic. But frankly, that doesn't feel like the right answer, because it makes it sound like Herbert Daniel's life serves as a kind of historical clothesline on which to hang important moments in recent history. And that image would do both Herbert Daniel and the book that uh, and Jim Green's biography of him, An Injustice. 
The reason to read Exile Within Exiles is not to access some larger historical process, but to immerse ourselves in the worlds and struggles and shenanigans of Herbert Daniel, Eli Mesmo, he himself, and appreciate his singular story, though I realize that we cannot suppress the reasonable impulse to see how much we can generalize and move beyond his singularity. Jim writes about Herbert Daniel's life with admiration and affection, but also with respect for his singular existence. Exile Within Exile offers no easy psychosocial explanation for Daniel's radicalization, though it does pro provide us with some clues, among them Daniel's love of reading and his attraction to the intellectual world at the Federal University, a world then entirely dominated by the left. Jim also portrays Daniel's years in the armed resistance as involving dilemmas and anxieties that go beyond the usual fear of failure of nerve or terror of being captured, tortured, and forced to betray one's comrades. We have other accounts of, of similar experiences of uh, people who had to suppress their sexual identities to fit in to armed groups. Uh, but Daniel's prominent role in the clandestine movement and his commitment to it at a moment when the armed left was in a particularly machista phase and his constant anxiety about his body and his physical appearance made his situation especially poignant. I was going to read a passage about this, but I am starting to run out of time, so I'm going to go move on. And then there are the episodes which simply have to be filed under you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Indeed, if Jim had been writing a novel and inserted a chapter in which the man, main character and his soon-to-be lover, still leading in clandestine lives, opened up a discotheque <laughs> in a small city in Minas Gerais that briefly becomes the town's leading hotspot, his editor would shake her head and say, this has to go. <laughs> but it was Everett Daniel's life, so it had to stay. Same with the gig he gets while in exile in Lisbon, writing for a women's magazine, Modas y Bordados, being transformed, uh, a magazine that was being transformed into a more feminist publication following the overthrow of the Portuguese dictatorship in 1974. As Daniel himself joked to one of his regular correspondents, what better end could there be in the life of a retired terrorist than to become a writer from Modas y Bordados, fashion and embroidery, nostalgically looking at the women on the editorial staff while crocheting endlessly, unquote. Less surprising is his time in Paris, where he worked as a bath attendant in a sauna and openly assumed a gay identity. Reading this section, I found myself thinking about Samuel R. Delaney's The Motion of Light in Water and his epiphany in a Greenwich Village bathhouse. But in Everett Daniel's case, the constant tension between his commitment to radical politics, the paralyzing effects of exile, and the friction between his sexual desires and his political commitments meant that he was unlikely to have that moment of unmitigated joy and communion. And I suppose that, above all, we see him emerge upon his return to Brazil in 1982, I think it was, mm -hmm. as a writer of great depth, insight, and even audacity. Finally, as the finale, we follow Daniel as he begins a new phase as a militant crusading for AIDS awareness and treatment. In some sense, his diagnosis could have led to his last exile. For he, even though he could now count on the solidarity of the gay community, he strikes me as someone who never wanted to restrict himself to one particular world. But he was also done with being somebody, uh, being someone he wasn't. That is, he wouldn't conceal the fact that he was HIV positive. And so he became the most outspoken AIDS activist in the Brazil of that era. It's difficult to gauge what impact Daniel's participation in armed struggle in the late 60s, early 70s had. But I would say with some confidence that his writings and talks about AIDS made a genuine difference and maybe help explain the single most progressive social pro policy of the presidency of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, the decision to ignore international patent restrictions and distribute antiretroviral medication free of charge, a decision that probably saved hundreds if not thousands of lives. There are many moments in the book that I would describe as deeply moving and affecting, not least of course being Herbert Daniel's death at the absurdly early age of 45. 
But perhaps my favorite quote from any interview is the final commentary from Danielle's devoted mother, Donna Jenny, whom Jim met with many times. A theme in all of their conversations seems to have been how physically lazy and almost inert Danielle was, which may strike you as utterly <laughs> counterintuitive, except that a number of other people who were close to him more or less confirm that. <laughs> Jim quotes her as saying to Danielle, my son, you don't even know how to change a light bulb. How are you going to confront the world? <laughs> Thanks to Jim's beautiful book, we know that he did. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Robert and Jim, for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I will start with a tale of two titles. Each of them tells a story, though both of them tell, also tell the same story. The English title of James Green's book, Exile Within Exiles, Herbert Daniel, Gay Brazilian Revolutionary, highlights one facet of the text and of Daniel's life. Its Portuguese counterpart, Revolucionario Gay, A Vida Extraordinária de Herbert Daniel, uh, pioneiro na luta pela democracia, diversidade e inclusão, seems to centralize another aspect of Daniel's trajectory. Both titles, however, point to the richness of Jim's biography of Brazilian political and social activist Herbert Eustáquio de Carvalho, better known as Herbert Daniel. And if you want to know the reason for the change of name, go and read the book. The English title suggests a series of interlocking stories centered on the theme of exile. The word exile assumes different meanings in Jim's manuscript. Beyond geographical displacement, Daniel's banishment from Brazil to France, then to Portugal, and then back to France, um, <clears throat> Exile Within Exile touches upon Daniel's internal ostracism, his fight to reconcile his hom homosexuality with his participation in the armed struggle against the military dictatorship. Danielle depicts this experience, and I quote from Jim's book, silence and exile. I wasn't a homosexual militant. I was an exiled homosexual, end of quote. Though exile is central in the English language version title of the text, it would be too simplistic to reduce the book to this word, exile, is a tagline that points to other themes that connect and expand from this motif. The title of the Portuguese language version of Exile Within Exiles, which was published in 2018 by Companhia das Letras, hints at these diverse and nevertheless intertwined thematic threads. Revolucionário gay, a vida extraordinária de Herbert Daniel, pioneiro na luta pela democracia, diversidade e inclusão. It's a long title, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, revolutionary and gay, the extraordinary life of Herbert Daniel, pioneer in the struggle for democracy, diversity, and inclusion, suggests that Jim's book is simultaneously a biography and an overview of Brazil's social political panorama since the mid-1960s, a history of the country's military dictatorship, the story of the armed resistance against this regime, and of the country's redemocratization. To say that Exile Within Exiles is broad as scope is, therefore, an understatement. Because of this, I'm not going to give you a summary of the book. Not only would this be tiresome, and we don't have the time for that, but the idea is that you read it yourselves. Neither will I offer a book review. There are already some good reviews of Exile Within Exiles available, and I'm sure that the book will inspire many others. I might even suggest that you, after you read the book, go and write a review yourselves. Since my disciplinary background is in literary and cultural studies, I'm more interested, and not to say anything of qualified, in examining exile and exiles from this perspective, especially as Jim's book lends itself very well to such reading. The text, though steeped in history and indebted to the methodologies of this field, such as archival work and the interviews that Barbara mentioned, is also a literary document. In a way, it echoes Danielle's own forays into literature. Indeed, Exile Within Exile weaves Danielle's semi-autobiographical literary text into its own narrative fabric, engaging in an intertextual exercise that references and comments on several of Danielle's books. Indeed, the English 
title of Jim's text alludes to the leitmotiv of Daniel's first novel, Passagem para o Próximo Sonho, published in 82, namely the experience of exile. As Exile Within Exile's Portuguese title suggests, its narrative structure combines different genres, such as the Bildungsroman, the novel Formation, as we can see in, from the uh, title A Vida Extraordinaria, the albeit somewhat unorthodox action-adventure story suggested by the sobriquet Revolucionari Gay, and Jim does a really good job of creating cliffhangers at the end of different chapters, and of course the biography. These genres mix se seamlessly, resulting in a queering of history. By queering, I do not simply mean that Jim exposes the complex gender dynamics within Brazil's opposition to the military dictatorship though Exile Within Exile certainly does that as well. The book queers history by going beyond the pale of the documentary. Exile Within Exiles is animated by the gaze of a fellow gay rights and anti-dictatorship activist. The subjective viewpoint adds to the narrative texture of the book. I would argue that the literary echoes in Exile Within Exile complexify our understanding of Brazil's his re recent history. The book fractures our knowledge of the resistance to the military regime. On the one hand, Jim's book highlights the idealism and courage of many revolutionaries, including Edward Daniel, as they fought against a highly repressive dictatorship. On the other hand, the text also problematizes this endeavor. Exile Within Exiles reveals how a culture of compulsive heterosexual masculinity overlaid the leftist ideals of the resistance. This culture was not only homophobic, not completely, but there were large parts of it, but also misogynistic. The book also exposes how, and I quote again, the dynamics of survival, end quote, became the modus of Randy of the leftist struggle at a certain point. These dynamics ultimately proved to be infertile and in some cases fatal. To be clear, Exile Within Exiles does not question the importance of resistance to authoritarian oppressive regimes, be they military or identitarian. Rather, it transforms Herbert Daniel's story into a manifesto of this resistance at multiple levels. As Exile Within Exile filters national history through the intimate affective story of Herbert Daniel, it encourages the reader to forge a personal link to this story. Like other books that straddle history and literature, such as fellow, fellow guerrilla member Alfredo Cirques, Os Carbonaros, which was published in 81, and more recently, Marcelo Rubin's Paivas, Ainda Estou Aqui, which was published in 2015, Jim adds, it, Jim's text adds immediacy to our comprehension of the military dictatorship, the resistance to the regime, the democratic transition, and its struggle for social justice that Herbert Daniel emblematized. By doing this, Exile Within Exiles prompts us to reflect on how Daniel's struggles reverberate in contemporary Brazil. In his study on the relationship between human rights and the novel, historian Lynn Hunt um, proposes that the concept of human rights that came about in the 18th century owed its emergence partly to literary narratives that generated identification between the reader and the protagonists of the stories. Hunt states that, and I quote, Human rights could only flourish where people learn to think of others as their equals, as like them in some fundamental fashion. They learned this equality, at least in part, by experience identification with ordinary characters who seem dramatically present and familiar." End quote. We recognize this modus operandi in exile within exiles. The first chapter, which describes Daniel's funeral, sets the tone that will dominate the remainder of the book. The sense of loss felt by the family is communicated by, the pa by passages such as, and I quote, Geraldo, Herbert's father, Don Eugenie, and Claudio held each other, supporting one another while they slowly followed the coffin, end quote. The rendering of the scene, its attention to the detail of loving support in the face of tragedy, strikes a chord in the reader. We are led to empathize with the sorrow of Claudio, Daniel's life partner, Don Eugenie, and Senor Geraldo. In this moment, Daniel's story leaves the realm of public politics, his trajectory as a revolutionary and later as a social activist, and gains another dimension, one that is often obfuscated by traditional historiographical accounts. 
we want to know more about who the person Herbert Daniel was, what the emotions were that, <coughs> excuse me, drove him, what made him laugh and cry. The intensely private scene of the grieving family is juxtaposed to the public discourse around Daniel's funeral. Now, the former image stems from the author's personal engagement with the subject of this book, a subject he did not, as someone, some might expect, know personally. The latter showcases the historiographical vein of exile within exiles. I quote, Obituaries and other journalistic essays also emphasize his past as a guerrilla, end quote. The authorial voice subtly insinuates the archival research that underpins the text we're reading. The notes at the end of each chapter are another clue to this work. Beyond merely just opposing private remembrance and public memory, however, Exile Within Exiles highlight the f highlights the fluidity between them. Donna Genie keeps an album with news clips of her son's funeral. Perhaps these are the same clips that the historian consulted when researching the book. The clips are simultaneously artifacts of public and personal history. They are but one element in a mnemonic repertoire that makes Herbert Daniel present in the here and now, in the act of reading. The ending of the first chapter hints at the richness of this repertoire at how its composition straddles different realms. Using a very literary flourish, the evocation of synesthesia, in which one sense stimulates another, the narr narrator highlights how memories are triggered. Donna Genie shows her guest, a foreign historian who is writing a book about her son, a bottle of Chanel No. 5. The iconic perfume, a magical fra fragrance, the color of amber, and that was a quote, helps Dona Genie conjure the remembrance of her son. She explains that, every time I want to think about him, I dab on a little, it helps me remember, end quote. Here we have a complex interplay of memorial work. Storytelling and reminiscence are mutually enabling. Memory is activated by storytelling, but also is the material that makes storytelling possible. Much like the sense, scent of Chanel No. 5 evokes the remembrance of her son to Dona Genie, the description of this operation elicits a new layer of memory, one that is not based on lived experience, but on reading. Words, sense, memories actualize and expand the life story of Herbert Daniel. In the introduction to their study on life narratives and human rights, Kay Schaefer and Sidney Smith suggest that, quote, as people meet together and tell stories or read stories across cultures, they begin to voice, recognize, and bear witness to a diversity of values, experiences, and ways of imagining a just, just social world and of responding to injustice, inequality, and human suffering." End quote. With these words in mind, let me finish with a brief proscript of sorts. On March 14, 2018, Carriaga Councilwoman Maria Franco was assassinated by militiamen. In November 2018, Jair Bolsonaro, apologist of the Brazilian dictatorship and of its brutal repression methods, was elected Brazil's 38th president. Bolsonaro's election has already reverberated negatively in some of the areas for which Herbert Daniel fought, non-discrimination, gender equality, the environment. In January of this year, Congressman John Willis, whom Jim calls Daniel's political heir, and who was Brazil's secondly open gay uh, elected gay consul, congressman, opted to leave Brazil after repeatedly having his life threatened. His story and his words in the introduction to Exile Within Exiles highlights how the fight for democracy, diversity, and inclusion that defined Erwitsch Daniel's life is as relevant now as it was when he was alive. Exile Within Exiles is an important document in the endeavor to counteract the rise of far-right ideology and discourses that denigrate many of the values that Herbert Daniel held dear. With this, I invite you to go and read the book if you have not already done so. <laughs> um, so I didn't prepare anything because I didn't know what my friends were going to say, so this is all going to be just off the cuff. I first want to thank Jessica, uh, the marvelous director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And I want to say, Jessica, um, I worked very hard to build the center, 
And you have done a wonderful job of sustaining it and blossoming in ways that I never could have imagined. I'm really grateful for everything you've done for, for us at Brown. And Kate, who is amazingly efficient in doing all the operations, and we love her for that as well. Uh, Robert Self, the crazy masochistic chair of the history department. Uh, Ramon Stern, who uh, has made everything possible at the Brazil initiative. I'm getting for Clemt here. I don't know why this is all about. And um, I think two wonderful people. One, Barbara Weinstein, who I really consider my closest colleague uh, in the profession, who supported me since the first time I met her in my career. Um, my, my advisor who worked on Brazil had died. I didn't have anyone to write letters for me. It was really, and she just was really open and wonderful since the first time I met her, the HA. And then a new close friend, Leila, who comes to Brown and is, is bringing new energy and life to the, to the uh, department. But I think of all, I'm looking around this room, and it's the reason I love this university is the students at Brown University who keep me young, keep me remembering, that I make me think I'm 25, even though I'm not anymore. Uh, and we have a particularly amazing community these last couple of years, um, and it's really grown stronger in the resistance that we're building here at Brown and, and nationwide and internationally. And so all of you who have taken classes with me, who have come to my office hours, who ask for advice, been really, really important. And it's going to make it, I'm not going to ever retire because I don't want to lose this energy that I give to my students. Uh, and in fact, you know, um, the last person I wanted to recognize is my partner, Moshe Slohovsky, who is kind of cowering in the back there, shyly uh, sitting there. But we've been together 25 years, and our relationship has been insane. It's been across four continents, uh, many separations, many frequent flyer miles. And he has put up with all of my craziness since the first day he met me and has been very tolerant of all the things that I've wanted to do. And, and so I'm really deeply, um, really appreciative of everything he's done for me in my career. Um, when I... When I um, went back to graduate school to go into the job market, I had a problem. I had a big gap in my CV from when I graduated in political science in German from Erlum College in 1972 and trying to get a job in 1996. And at the time, I didn't really feel I could explain to people in the job market what happened in those 20 years. I had not been in rehabilitation. Nor I had gone to a desert island, but had been actively in engaged in political activities in Brazil before going to Brazil against the military regime and after the coup in Chile as a, as a solidarity activist. And then in Brazil, joining an underground organization not as revolutionary or as radical as Everton Daniels, but fighting for six years against the military regime, being a founding member of the the LGBT movement in Brazil and its left leader, the leader that tried to build a dialogue between the left and uh, this emergent movement. Um, and then uh, coming back to the United States, living in Los Angeles and being first a community organizer and then a union organizer until in 1989, I kind of finally figured out there wasn't going to be a revolution in the United States <laughs> and I didn't have Social Security benefits <laughs> or retirement benefits. The state was not going to take care of me and so I had to find another way to survive having worked as a social worker and really wanting to do something different. So, uh, you know, going back to uh, the university was the smartest thing I could have done because it gave me the opportunity to, to create in the academic uh, arena the politics which I created the 30 years before that or the 25 years before that. So my first book, Beyond Carnival, was a very conscious political intervention into academia to be a pioneering work in a social history of male homosexuality when there was not really good works in in Latin America and very few in the United States. We Cannot Remain Silent was really a response to a Brazilian in this country who had said that no one had done anything in this country to oppose the military regime, and I knew otherwise, and ended up writing a very long book to prove that point. And then um, working on Herbert Daniel's life, which um, uh, just came to me, and it was I had a lot of doubts about it until I actually met Donna Genie, and she really convinced me um, to tell the story of his life. Uh, obviously, um, his story is not my story, but it mirrors my story in some ways. Um, our engagement in politics, our passion for politics in the 60s and beyond, uh, the dilemmas of a left which was hostile towards homosexuality uh, and, and trying to, we understood it, but they didn't, and to convince the left that they were wrong and had to change. Um, and constantly reinventing himself. Because Daniel, um, I think one of the things which is amazing about him and his life is that he 
decided to be a medical student and he wanted to be a director, a writer. He, beca he became a revolutionary. He reinvented himself when he went into exile. He came back to Brazil, reinvented himself as a politician, as a writer, and then when he got HIV and AIDS, he reinvented himself as an AIDS activist and died being an activist. So in a very different way, I've had to kind of reinvent myself, but maintaining my own kind of dedication to my principles over the years. And that, I think, comes me to, um, I was asking Moshe, what do I talk about tonight? He said, talk about politics, which I was kind of surprised he would tell me that, to do that, because I thought I was supposed to talk about academic stuff. But I think I do want to talk about politics tonight, because I and many people in this room never thought we would live the day in Brazil after 30 years of democracy and a feeling that the social movements were building and, and, and forging a strong uh, social civil society that could guarantee equal rights for all and there would be a, a significant redistribution of wealth in the country and poverty would be eliminated and the poor people that really tore at our hearts when we were young or the first times we were in Brazil would no longer be beggars on the streets and it would be a glorious future. And that has all come uh, dashing down over our heads in the last three years. First with the impeachment of uh, President Jimmy Mousseffi and then the horrendous government of Michel Temer and now the election of an apologist for the military regime and torture, a person who hates all of us in this room uh, and has not, and, and his, and his, his beliefs are not just campaign rhetoric. When I talk about the situation to the media, um, I, to Americans, I try to help them understand what's happening in Brazil. Uh, and I say, well, it's the Trump of the tropics, but 10 times worse. And that makes people think a lot. Well, what does it mean to be 10 times worse than Donald Trump? Is that possible? How would it be possible? What would it mean to be in a country where the president is worse, 10 times worse, uh, than Ronald McDonald? And um, I, think, I think this is our challenge is, is at this moment, is to really think of the ways we, living outside of Brazil, who love Brazil for whatever reason, Brazilians, Brazilians, people who study Brazil, what do we do to respond to this moment in this country's history after we've all had so much help, hope and how much this hope has been dashed by uh, recent events. The, the failures of the left, the mistakes of the left, the inadequacies of the left in responding to the challenges of trying to transform society. And now what do we do? What is to be done? How to respond to this new situation? And so I just wanted to talk just two or three minutes about that. I think I'm going to end early so we can have time for conversations and then the reception to say that well, one of the nice things, well, let's see. I've been thinking about international solidarity for 45 years. Since I joined a picket line in front of the Brazilian embassy in 1973 in September against the torture in Brazil, since I got involved in uh, political activities even before that uh, against the war in Vietnam. So um, early on, in in 2018, when the writing seemed to be on the wall, some of us went through a kind of a alternative moment of thinking things would be different in, in June or July, that maybe the left would really win the elections when we thought that Bolsonaro had a ga glass ceiling of 22 to 25 percent. But besides that kind of moment of, of illusion that maybe the left would manage to um, be come back to power with uh, Fernando Haddad leading a ticket, um, I think I realized that we had a really big serious challenge ahead of us. And it wasn't something that would be a year or two years or even an electoral cycle or even for a victorious electoral cycle. It was too much to be done to fix all that has been done, including the mistakes of the left. And in this way, I think Ebuchi Daniel and I have something in common, that he was not afraid in exile to take the first step in seriously criticizing the armed struggle in Brazil and its errors. And there are people in Brazil who have been in recent power in government who still are not able to do that. He was able to look clearly at the errors that the left had made, criticize them in a positive way, in a way to think towards the future. That was a criticism that led him to be one of the founders of the Green Party, which later had a very um, unfortunate turn in terms of its politics and its composition, but he really was one of the first people to think about environmental justice in Brazil as he was thinking about LGBTQ rights. And so one of the things that is the biggest challenge for everyone in this room and beyond this room, the people involved in this international movement for solidarity with Brazil and people in Brazil, is to think how we really can uh, critically assess the past and build a new future in Brazil and beyond. Um, and that leads me to the final comment I want to make, which is this uh, amazing movement, which is being led by people in this room 
uh, the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil, the national meeting we organized in, in, at Columbia University at the law school with 200 activists and academics to think how we could build a national movement, how we could have 100 ac uh, public events to honor um, the memory of uh, Marielle Franco on the 14th of March, the anniversary of the assassination, and to denounce the ongoing repression of Afro-Brazilians, women, and um, a, an array of peoples in Brazil who have suffered before but are going to suffer more under this new regime. Uh, and organizing 100 organizations nationwide, something that's never happened in the movement for Brazilian solidarity over the course of the last 45 years. So we have huge tasks ahead of us. And I think those of us who are really committed to this have to take a deep breath, understand this is going to be a long process, that we need to uh, love each other and support each other in this process and be gentle on each other because it's not going to help to think that this is all going to be solved tomorrow. And we have to give, give all of us a uh, tremendous amount of, of solidarity. And although I kind of knew that, it was part of my Quaker upbringing and the way I, I took my values to the left uh, in the years that I was involved in political actions as a, as a militant, a militant, um, I think Herbert Daniel also, in another way, gave me another example of a person who always kept his humanity and his um, sensitivity and his creativity, his intellectual uh, abilities in all moments while he was... Um, fighting against uh, the dictatorship and fighting against uh, social injustice in Brazil and, and, and discrimination against HIV AIDS when he discovered he was HIV positive, even before he discovered he was HIV positive when he joined a, a, an AIDS group in 1987. And so he had a slogan which became part of um, the movement for AIDS. Um, he said two things. He said the best cure for AIDS is solidarity. And the first time I heard that, I thought that's a really dumb slogan. I mean, the best cure for AIDS is a medical treatment, you know? It's some antiretrovirus or some cocktail. But he really understood before there was a medical solution to uh, people being able to live with AIDS and the disease long term, is that we need to reach out to each other, we need to give each other solidarity. That the isolation, the discrimination that people living with HIV AIDS experienced was directly a, re a result of homophobia and prejudice and discrimination, and the best way that people could confront the disease and the anxiety and the fear around that was receiving love and solidarity from other people. And the last thing, and the thing that he said, and has become one of the ways I signed the book, is viva a vida, long live life, kind of, a, kind of a banal little statement, you know, to make, but I think was profoundly important to him because he had been told when he had HIV that he was receiving a death sentence, that he was going to die, that his life was, the days were counted. And he said, I, he really turned that around and made that, that, the mission of his life was to value every day and what he was doing every day. Now I, in the, in the, in the flurry of all the work that I do, and the inability to say no, and the, the arrogance to think I can do many two things, and my poor partner has to put up with it, um, I, I don't think I allow myself to, um, value each day, because uh, I'm rushing for the next thing that has to get done. Um, but I guess um, if I can try to learn something from Robert Daniel, I'm going to really try to take his slogan seriously in mind, use that mantra, as we all, um, who are very busy academics with families and relationships and lives and complications and wanting to do political action, need to really to do that. What's been really wonderful, and this is the Brazilian culture that I allowed myself to bring to Brown and get over the fear of hugging and touching that has become, you know, the, the paranoia of academia nowadays is that we do have a community here of beijos and hugs, abraços, which I really like. And so I'm not going to restrain from that, uh, even, uh, even though that's something that makes people very, very uncomfortable in academia. And that's part of um abraço, aquele abraço, um abraço, a hug, a show of support to uh, all of the companheiros and companheiros who are here in the room, all of my colleagues who are here, the people that are here tonight with me, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight. It really means a lot to me. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much, all three of you. This was really tremendous and um, incredibly engaging. I will act as a kind of um, moderator and and, uh, and and host and call on, on, on the audience, and please direct your questions, feel free to direct your questions at any of the panelists, an open question to all the panelists, however you would like to proceed. Yes, Hi, 
I'm Marina. I'm a master's student for the Portuguese and Brazilian Studies Department. And you mentioned you struggle a little bit with the decision to write about Herbert Daniel, and, and, and that that came about kind of suddenly. But how did it come about that it was like him you were going to write about? So, uh, it's a long story, I'll do a short version of it. I was trying to write an article based on an interview I'd done with a political prisoner who told me the story of a gay couple who were having sex in, in, in a prison and were marginalized and perhaps threatened with that revolutionary execution. And I was looking for material on that and I stumbled on his, his, uh, his uh, first memoir, uh, Passagem para o Próximo Sonho. And it was just fascinating. But it was a book written while he was in exile when the military was still in power, when he was still under the um, the culture of hiding and, and, and keeping information and, and being secret, and so I really didn't feel I could I couldn't really figure out his story very well. It was a very opaque kind of biography or memoir, and I just didn't think I had sources for it, and um, and so I wrote this article that took forever to get published. Um, but um, and then someone said, well, uh, hey. You know, have you interviewed his mother? And I said, his mother exists. What's the name of his mother? Where does she live? And so I called her, and she said, yeah, I'll come and interview me. And so I went to her house, and uh, she gave me this amazing story. And in the middle of the story, um, I think I write this in the introduction. She, uh, she said, uh, oh, what was the name of Robert Daniel's girlfriend? And I went, he didn't have a girlfriend. In my home. That's, that's, no. And and uh, her son had called her, and he, he gave her the name. And so I wrote that name down, and I was very lucky that um, I felt I kind of had a story. She had sent me on a mission to write his story because he had been forgotten. But when I interviewed his best friend in high school, and she told me all these amazing stories that she, you know, had experienced with him, and um, I, I realized that I could do it, that I could get enough material for the early years and the, and the high school years. And then I knew it would be easier to get the material from the revolutionary years because there were so many people around although everyone had a very bad memory. It was really hard to get good stories out of most revolutionaries. They just couldn't reconstruct very well a lot of things that happened. So it took a lot of piecing things together. The, the biography is very complete. I mean, I think anyone who has an illusion to tell a complete story is, is kind of fooling you. But in my case, it was very clear there were just things I'll never know about him, and I would die to know. Um, sources have come to me since the books come out, like... Um, his partner's sister, uh, niece, said, oh, I have the portfolio of all of his artwork. And I had interviewed the mother and, and didn't know that. And that would have been really wonderful to have that, because it, it revealed things that I didn't know about their lives together. But I think one of the nice things about writing something is that it's incomplete, because then you, you can just move on and know that it's never going to be perfect, and you can do something else. So. Uh, uh, my question is, I suppose, for all three, but maybe especially for the historians. Um, and following up a little bit on something Barbara said in her comments, which is, how do you understand, and Jim, as you were writing this, this tension that Barbara pointed out between understanding Herbert Daniel as, you know, in the moment in which he was operating, the, the Cold War, the underground left, um, versus drawing larger lessons from his evolution, from his political activity. And the example that I, that I have in mind when I was thinking about this question is, the upcoming film about Marighella, based on the biography written by uh, Magalhães. Uh, is it? Carlos Magalhães. Yeah, yeah. And the director, Wagner Moura, he's making the explicit argument that no, this is a revolutionary figure that we need to be thinking about. We need to be, you know, valori uh, you know valorizing right now, rem remembering right now. And to me, it seems like the present moment in Brazil, Herbert Daniel is more the one we should be kind of looking to more than Marighella, I think, if we were to have to pick sort of these models for the revolutionary period. Uh, but just if you could elaborate a little more about how you think about that, considering them in, the, in their life and times, as it were, versus the broader implications of their life. I was sure you were going to say everyone. I think everyone has, probably has a, has a view said, on that. He said the historian. <laughs> <laughs> but you were actually were the only person who quoted a historian in your. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's interesting because I wasn't. I was thinking about kind of a tension between a specific life story and generalizing, so singularity versus gen gen generality. And so it's, it's a somewhat different issue, and that could be anybody, and it wouldn't have to be the person we need to know now. 
I, you know, I guess I would be always really cautious about saying this is a person who I need to write about because we need to valorize this person now because now changes so quickly that, you know, when you first started working, now was a very different now when you first started working on this. So I think you have to, particularly with something like a biography, you have to invest in that person without worrying about whether at a, you know, the moment of publication this is the person we need to know. And film is a little different, but I think books take so long that, um, um, although not as long for you as they take for me. <laughs> but, um, um, so uh, so I, I, I guess it's, I, I was sort of directing my thoughts at a, at a somewhat different question. So, so I now we'll turn it over to you. So. You're the historian. Yeah. <laughs> I made that very clear. Uh, well, I'm going to actually respond to that in a different way because I'm going to I'm going to share the exciting news I have. Maybe this is bad luck, but I don't think it is. So, um, the dream of every historian is get a book made into a movie. And I, when I started writing this book, I knew that it was a movie. We did not set this question up now. You knew that I wanted to talk about this. So. This is when your st former students know you so well, they throw the softball to you without even agreeing to do that. So, um, so I had a friend who was a documentary filmmaker who I was hoping maybe he would want to do the movie or give me a reference to a person who might. So I asked for advice and the person said, well, when offers come your way, when the book comes out in Brazil, you know, uh, talk to me and I'll give you advice on them. And so some offers came my way and I thought about them and um, decided to do the film with a woman who has done a very wonderful award-winning uh, uh, documentary and just recently uh, did a movie on a young girl who comes back as the daughter of exiles to, um, to Brazil. And she had knew Ebrich Daniel when she had just returned from her own exile in 81, 82. She was a young woman, a young writer, and Daniel spent a whole afternoon helping her with her writing. And she really loved him from that moment, that experience. And so we met a couple of times, and she said, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, do your, I'll do your film, but what kind of film do you want? Because I can't do a biopic. I can't do what you describe. I can't do a story of the revolutionary figure from young revolutionary to old revolutionary and all the dramatic scenes of the bank robberies and the arrests and the massacre, et cetera, et cetera. If you want that kind of film, I can't do it. And I said, well, okay, well, what kind of film do you want to do? And um, sh she came up with a really smart answer. And um, it, it had to do with looking at his life through the lens of his body and his sexuality and thinking about them um, as a way of looking at him in a different way than my book did. Um, with the left background of the revolutionary movement, et cetera, is there. Um, but not as the central. And so then I had the opportunity to go to dinner with two very close friends who both knew Herbert Daniel. One, one knew Herbert Daniel from that period, and the other um, was you know, really enamored of the book. And I told both of them about this, this idea, and they hated this idea. They thought this was a loud, <laughs> they said, no, 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 you have, to, you have to tell the story of the revolutionary from his whole life story. And, and the other person literally took me and looked in my eyes and said, Jim, do not do this movie with this person. Um, and so I decided to ignore their ideas. And so, uh, so the reason, well, there are two reasons for that. One is that I think that if the book is so good, then everyone's going to say, oh, I really love the book, but the movie wasn't as good as the book. And so why do a movie based on the book that's the book? So that's the kind of the arrogant um, uh, approach to the whole thing. But the other is I don't think you can really pack into a movie this life. There are 18 chapters, eight, 18 different lives, and I think it would be very tedious and hard to do. So we're going to go with the, with the movie version. With I got a director, I got a producer, I'm hiring a lawyer, and so maybe in three to five years we'll have a movie. Maybe we won't because the economic situation in Brazil might not allow that to happen. But this is really a dream that I really want to achieve, and we'll see if it happens. I, I intend to be here in three to five years. If you, yeah. Oh, back to this room. Okay, yeah, no, but I thought you meant like come back to Brown. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That would be very cool. So, uh, so my question is uh, both for the author and for the readers. 
so um, Jen just gave this really good advice that every project is going to be incomplete and you have to just accept that and move on, otherwise you'll never finish, which is really wise and students should be listening to that. Um, but, so I've, but you said there were things that you would die to know and I just wondered if you'd give me one example of what is one thing you wish you knew about this guy. And then the same to Leila and Barbara, if that was something that as you were reading the book, was there something you wish you knew about him that you didn't find out? I'm always wondering how historians, you know, what they're dying to know. It's a great question. <laughs> it looks like nothing. <laughs> Actually, I do, and I think, it, I think it's because you commented on this several times. It's that one scene where he catches, they're in this retreat, and he catches the two yeah, um, yeah. guys having sex. Also, gorillas having yeah. sex, and it's not clear who they are, and and. Y you seem very intrigued by it, and when I was reading the book, I was like, who are they, who are they? <laughs> I'll explain that in a minute. Do you want to say something? Well, there are a couple of things, but I think the thing that I was most curious about was uh, one of the very first um, armed actions that the group he's connected to, I don't think he himself was involved in it, but the, um, uh, but the, but the group that he was con um, tied to, the, that it was an assault on a bank, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the, there are two uh, police who are killed. And, you know, these are not, you know, these are not torturers in military prisons. These are guys who are basically, they're, they're cops. And um, his father and his brother were mm -hmm. in the military police. And so he was a, a you know, a, a cadet. And uh, so, um, you know, you might say, well, they're, you know, they're enemies of the people, they're working for the state, but they, they, these are working guys, these are not, they, 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 they and, um, and so I don't think you could have had access to this, but what I wanted to know was what, did he think, did he ever stop and say, one of those eyes could have been my brother Amilton, or my father, um, Gerald, uh, and um, what, you know, so, you know, I was very active in left politics, not quite that, I mean, I started being very active around 1969, so actually not such a different time. And the, even in the US, there were people talking about, should we use violence, should we not use violence? And you know, one of the issues is if you use violence, not only are you, might you be killed, but you might kill somebody else. And how do you feel about that? And you never get a sense in, from him, anything he says, that that was something that was an impediment to him. And so, and I wondered why and how that could be. Again, because as far as I can tell, he loved his brother, he loved his father. And yet, um, right. you know, so. Yeah, so I could not answer that question. I wanted to know it too. He died, uh, people around him, I asked these kinds of questions, they had no answer to me, and I tried to address it to a certain extent. I think he was in the logic of the moment of these groups that was in a bubble that was thinking, well, these are just, you know, it's a time of war and our comrades are in, in prison and they're being tortured and we have to do what we need to do and people get killed accidentally in these, these moments. I think that's how he would have understood it. Uh, what's also bizarre is that I asked his brother, like, I think five times, like, why did, so the police never invaded their house. They never did anything to retaliate against the father or the son whose, whose, whose brother was in a very important revolutionary organization and was the leader of one. And there was a, si a pact of silence or a pact, a gentleman's agreement between the military and this family that he was one thing and they were another thing, uh, which I just, I never understood that. Um, it was very strange. Uh, and, the, and the thing that I would love to know is actually, I, I, I planted in the book for the Brazilian audience uh, a question, a Sherlock Holmes question, because there is a scene in which he's in a revolutionary meeting in a clandestine place and he runs into two men who are having sex. And I know the two different meetings are going to be been and I know exactly everyone who was in those two meetings and of course the question is okay who were these two people and he didn't make this up because there's enough internal information to know that this is real and so some of the people that have been my informants and I have been trying to answer the question of this you know gossipy like who was the <laughs> these two people who were having sex um, and I'm waiting for someone to kind of 
read the book and finally come to me and kind of, I think I know it is, but I want to get it confirmed. So that's the thing I really want to know about the book, and I can never find that from this, this story. Uh, can I ask a question um, yeah. of the panel? Because you've all uh, written about this and thought about it. I, I want to return to the kind of machismo of the left in the 60s and 70s. And how, maybe starting with you, Jim, but also, Barbara, you've written about, uh, you've written about race in Brazil. And I, I wonder how you think about and talk about a, an imperfect left, a deeply imperfect left, um, particularly in, the, in this moment. A left that's filled with misogyny, was filled with um, homophobia, um, perhaps filled with some also some racism, uh, right? I, I just wonder how you kind of how do you write around that question? I don't mean I don't mean dodge it, but how do you write into that question? And, and as, as someone who's on the left, right, right uh, who wants on the one hand to you, know, you understand? How do you how do you think about that? So for me, there's two. There's another dilemma there, which is being a foreigner working on Brazil, writing about Brazil. You know, to what extent will your work be received or be negative? And I think the way I've been able to play around that is I have a, at least in more recent years, a, a, enough of a kind of a, a CV as a leftist activist that people respect me and therefore they have to take my work seriously and not dismiss it as just a gringo who doesn't understand Brazil, Brazilian culture and society. And I think my work is so meticulous that people have to respect that. The other part of this is that I, you know, I am a part of the left and so this is like, this is what I'm fighting about and against. And, and so it's a natural part of what I'm trying to, um, to raise in my writings from all three of the books that I've written and many other edited collections that I've done. Uh, it's an engagement. It, they're wrong. I mean, we're right. It, people are wrong. It's, we're in the 21st century. People are still living in models of the 19th century. But on the other hand, these are the, the people who believe abstractly in social justice for all. And therefore, that's the, the, the comp, that's the area of the world that I need to be a part of. And it's fighting with them. And, and for years, it was a defensive fight. Now it's not. I mean, I feel very confident to say, you guys are wrong. I'm sorry. You know, kind of wake up and smell the roses. Although, you know, we're going to have, right now in Brazil, there's a new debate, which I've just been listening to, which is, oh, identity politics was a big mistake. It divided the working class. And as a result of that, we've lost all these people we have to win back. We can't emphasize identity policy, which is a code word for LGBTQ rights, women's rights, and real strong fight against racism. That was a debate that I lived 40 years ago in Brazil in the 1970s when, during the period of the military regime, when we started the gay movement and the women's movement and the black movement also emerging, that was the same argument made by the same sectors of the left which are making it today. So it's not, we haven't won that battle at all. Barbara, do you want to, are you? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think the, the point, I think you know, both of the points that Jim emphasized, one is the, um, uh, the challenge of writing about Brazil as not a Brazilian, as, uh, as not a Brazilian, as a Brazilianist, but not a Brazilian. And I think um, you know, one of the ways I've dealt with that is actually typically the people I'm critical of most Brazilian academics are also critical of. So, you know, I mean, I'm talking about sort of, um, you know, right-wing racist movements in Sao Paulo, you know, so, I mean, I, no, although it's interesting because um, it, the most recent book, because I was criticizing people who are often the parents of people who are currently major mm. historians. Um, they were, um, and they like to think of their parents as anti-communist. They had, it's funny, they had no problem with them being anti-communist, but I was arguing that they were all, it was also a movement based on a celebration of whiteness and you know, sort of semi-white supremacy. And uh, that was really upsetting to them. So it was really, and I'm talking about people who I'm very, I know very personally, so I'm not making a generalization. I'm talking about people who I've interacted with about it. So, um, so I realized that sensitivities often run in directions that would, one might not expect. But I, I do think that uh, one of the advantages of being a historian is, is that, you know, uh, um, it's not so much saying, you know, you are wrong. It's sort of saying, well, this is the moment you were in. This was the like, this is what was likely to be 
your vision of the world at that moment, but we're not in that moment anymore. Now, what I think is really interesting is exactly this attempt to renovate uh, this argument about, to rehabilitate this argument about the whole problem is identity politics. And I we do think that's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, let me say that I don't think it's, I don't think that's an entirely dead argument. What I think is that the problem is that it's not interesting to think about the way the people who are raising it are interested. What I think one of the things to think about is the way in which certain kinds of projects, um, such as, for example, um, uh, cute, um, you know, sort of um, uh, petitioning to um, rights to land for quilombos, that, that I completely support. But does this have a vision of, for the broader society that can be, you know, that, that is meaningful? And I, so that I, I had, think you do have to think about. That, you know, do, do, do identity politics take us sometimes in a, uh, on a road that gets narrower and narrower rather than broader and broader? But not because it's bad to think in terms of identities, but, to, but rather what is the project of that identity? And those I think we always have to be critical of. So, and self critical. Um, I really don't have much yeah, to add to that. Uh, actually, I think that your last point is very good. It's, you know, it's kind of what is the larger, pro how does it connect to larger projects, right, um, of, of collectivity, of sociability, et cetera. And, um, and I think that you can see that also in literary production, right? Because there has been the segmentation of literary production. So you have, for, for, in a very good way also, because it has brought to the attention, you know, other voices. I mean, Brazilian literature has been very white, very middle class, very male, you know, and these, the emergence of these different voices has opened up, you know, a, a horizon, um, of, of perspectives that wasn't there before. But um, how, do you, how, you, how do you see them in there as individual expressions and yet also as part of a larger collectivity that is, you know, that shares certain values and certain worldview? Um, I'm interested, first of all, I really enjoyed the panel with Albert and Layla and Jim. Uh, but I was interested in readership. It seems that the panel has an audience. The panel has described very well the potential audience for this book. But when Jim mentioned the film, I was particularly intrigued because you said that you would go with this other filmmaker, which seemed to be counter to what you were doing in the book. Uh, and maybe, you know, I just put that wrong, but I'm curious if you did a film with that particular filmmaker, would you think that, that film would complement your book in some way? That you didn't, you know, at the time or the way with all or the resources to, to, uh, to develop that? I'm just curious because it seemed to me that you, you, you wanted to go with something else. Yeah, and I want someone else to go with something else in a way, too, because I think I don't know how to do a film, or I don't know how to do a film about his life, which would not be a biopic, which seems to be somewhat boring. And I think the book, you know, read the book if you like the story, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, this book will be signed in Latin American studies classes among some LGBT people my students were forced to buy this semester in the dictatorship class. <laughs> They'll put it in used books. It'll be circulating to other students in the future very quickly. Uh, it won't have a large readership here. I know that. I mean, that's our reality. In Brazil, no, I understand that. But, I'm, but, 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 the, but a film, the, the kind of film that I think will be interesting will not have a large viewership unless someone wants to make it in a miniseries for Global. And that would be a biopic. It could happen. I have a friend who wrote a very wonderful book about uh, uh, one of the people who was uh, uh, helped uh, Jews uh, leave, leave Germany. And Justo, the Monica Spu, and that is going to be made into a, a series for global TV. And so there'll be, I don't know, 15 million, 20 million people will see, see it perhaps, or I don't know what the audience is. And I don't, I don't think that it's likely that this book will turn into that kind of movie or that kind of TV series. Although it could. I mean, I think you could make it into that, maybe not now, but in five years when the climate is a little different. Um, but no, I partially I just really wanted to choose a really smart person and work with them and be co-producer and not scriptwriter, but 
can consult it and just learn about this. Because I mean, I think one of the things about for me for academia was every book had to be very at the core different and a different challenge. So my first book is extremely different from my second, and this one had to be different. And then the last two books that I theoretically am going to do in my career monographs, if I get to them, are very different one from the other. And so I, it's just to not repeat and do something really totally different that requires me to conceptualize, you know, this the challenge of writing a book in a very different way. So, And the movie is the same. I think that would be to work on a project which is not the book. It's something different from the book. Because I've done the book. I don't want to go back. I want to go on. I'm going to go forward. No, it just seems to me that there's more maybe implied or public consensus about this of a filmmaker is that actually you might have a wider audience uh, if, the, if the book is, if, if the film is based on, you know, on a much more humane level, a human level, not just a you know, historical, this happened here, yeah, this happened perhaps. there, yeah. getting into much more of an you know, interior sense of what this uh, that would be. That would be good, and um, we'll see. I mean, maybe this project might even never happen even, but we'll see. Yeah. So the hours of the clock tell us that there's reception. a reception waiting outside that I invite you to join us out there, and I invite you also to thank the panel.